last session. We're going to do some uh, working on developing bodhicitta, this warm-hearted attitude, using the eight verses of thought transformation that most of you know. Um, so we'll just dive into the meditation rather than a big explanation of them. Um, so um, the eight verses are never going to go out of style, so these are a good one to have in your tool belt. I'm going to break it in half, so we're not going to do all eight at once. I'll do half of them and then we'll have a little stretch and just check in and then go straight into the second half. So um, I'll put them on the screen. You don't need to read them. I'll read them to you. But if it helps you stay focused, kind of be like, which one are we at? I lost the thread for a second and you lean in and you go, oh yeah, yeah. So I'll put it on the screen, but you don't feel like you need to read it if you don't want to. And checking in and again with those areas in the body where you might regularly gather up tension and just see if you can consciously release those. Jaw, shoulders, lower back. Notice if anything's gotten achy over the course of the sessions. You might need to add a cushion under the knees or take away a cushion. And just do what you can to bring your body into physical balance. So that it feels like you're really being held and supported by your seat and very held and supported by your own spine. And if you've been meditating in a chair, you can just make sure that you haven't had any blood circulation um, stop or slow down because of the edge of the chair. So scooting more forward or scooting more backward. Putting an extra cushion behind you to keep you straight. And if your body is really hurting, you can lie down. To your motivation and think specifically, self-cherishing that is indifference to others, that looks after myself even at the expense of others, is one of the great troublemakers in my life. It narrows my focus, makes everything a big deal, closes my heart. The other great troublemaker is self-grasping ignorance, which views this conventionally existent I and then adds all sorts of extras, ideas of inherence, independence, and oneness. Dualism, separation, So in order to banish the ones to blame for everything, self-cherishing and self-grasping, I'm going to meditate on the eight verses. And in this way, being of greatest benefit to both myself and others. Through bodhicitta, I'll overcome self-cherishing. Through wisdom, I'll overcome self-grasping. And 
And then spending a minute or two with non-reactive meditation on the clarity of the mind. Watching your own thoughts without adding opinions to them. Keeping your mind in that place that doesn't anticipate. That's not running forward into the future or falling backward into the past. Those thoughts might occur, but you're not feeding them. They're just not interesting right now. What's interesting is the clarity of the mind, its spaciousness. So lean in and listen deeply to that aspect of consciousness that always has peace, even within chaos. Now from that spacious clarity, introduce the eight verses, starting with verse one. First, just sitting with the verse as a whole. And then you begin an inner conversation with the verse. Do I want to see all beings as precious? Do I want to hold them dear? Is there a benefit to myself and others in doing that? Is there a logic in doing that?
And so first we think about the fact that there has been huge benefit from sentient beings. From friends and relatives, we had education, care when we were young or sick, encouragement and support, maybe even criticism that was constructive or helped us build resilience. So much benefit from the friends in our life and those relatives that we feel connection and affinity for. This is obvious. And so we go even more deeply and think of the benefit from strangers. The buildings we use, the clothes we wear, the food we eat, the roads we drive on. So many structures, so many supports made and maintained by people we've never met, at least in this life. And we receive so much benefit from people that we don't get along with, people we don't like or resonate with. They show us ourselves, show us our gaps in compassion. Give us the opportunity to practice patience. are a condition for us to exhaust old negative karma. We build resilience because of them. Pathways of empathy to others who suffer because of them. Are reminded of behaviors that are harmful because of them making us like, less likely to do them, hopefully. So we first just establish that all sentient beings, friends, enemies, strangers, relatives, etc., already are of benefit, whether they intend to be of benefit or not, whether we view it that way or not, they already are. And then if we want to attain and obtain the greatest possible benefit from them, then we need to see them as precious and hold them dear. So the verse describes a wish-fulfilling jewel, some mythological object that if you hold it, you get whatever you want, every riches. Sentient beings are more powerful than that because from them you create the positive karma that ripens this happiness now and in the future. From them you learn what you need to learn. And so then you think with wise selfishness, what happens when you actually care for others? What happens when you have a sense of warmth and connection towards them? The moment you care for someone, they appear more positive to you. 
they appear as less of a threat. Your anxiety decreases. When we think only of ourselves, the focus of our mind narrows. And when the mind is narrow, uncomfortable things appear huge. So to derive benefit from sentient beings, we cultivate wanting to benefit to them. And this first verse is the most superficial. It's the surface level of beginning to widen our focus. But we have to start there, remembering it's in our own best interest to be caring. So in thinking of sentient beings as precious, we want to benefit them and care for them. And when we care for them, we create the causes for them to care for us. And for those that don't directly care for us, we can still feel the gratitude of how necessary it was to be challenged in order to grow. Just like we think that we'll get up to all sorts of positive projects when we have time, when we have patience, when there's vacation. But when that happens, when things are easy, sometimes we don't do any of those projects at all. But times that we're maybe very busy, but well motivated, a huge amount can be accomplished very efficiently. So if we only had people who were sweet and kind and validating, we would stay as we are. There wouldn't be any catalyst for growth. And those things that are hard now would remain hard because our focus would remain narrow and certain of the story we tell ourselves. And so then we decide that we are courageous enough to become more radical in our bodhicitta. We've decided we do hold sentient beings dear. What is the next level? And so verse two says, when in the company of others, I shall always consider myself as the lowest of all and from the depths of my heart, hold others dear and supreme. And using your wisdom, what does this mean? And what does this not mean? We want to counter arrogance and develop respect, which has nothing to do with cultivating low self-esteem.
This verse is an invitation for a very open and confident humility. So think about what would happen if you were in a group of people that you're normally with and you decided to adopt this attitude. Not changing your natural behavior, not saying significantly different things, but really holding yourself as the lowest of all. Holding them as dear and supreme. Feel the way it takes you out of competition. It takes you out of pushiness. It takes you out of neediness. Normally when we have anger or attachment, jealousy and pride, we just give in to them. With this first, we generate a sense of restraint. These beings are precious, they're dear and supreme. I'm not gonna let all my afflictions spill out all over them. Then you look at the opposite. What is the opposite of the lowest of all is being the highest of all. When you're puffed up with pride or arrogance and then no one is good enough to be around you. Nothing is good enough and you feel isolated and alone. Looking down at the people around you and also so separate from them. If you're the lowest of all, you can be with everyone. If all of them are dear, then there's a level of comfort and connection. You no longer need to be right or have the last word or need to be seen. Nothing to prove. Such a relief. Others feel safe with you. Others don't feel judged by you. And so feel your way into this sense of being the lowest of all as a position of strength, of confident humility that can listen and learn from absolutely anyone. We can respect even the smallest ant for its ability to carry so much, for its connection with its community,
we can respect a tiny baby for communicating its needs without needing to be elegant or graceful, without a facade or pretense. And so then we go even more deeply and think of verse three. Vigilant, the moment a delusion appears in my mind, endangering myself and others, I shall confront and avert it without delay. What does your wisdom mind say that this means? What way of living is it promoting? So we can start with this word vigilant, the way that we're careful when driving on a dangerous road, the way that we're attentive when holding something fragile or breakable. Aware when cooking a pot that might boil over This watchfulness that knows, with watchfulness, things are safe. And without watchfulness, there is danger. And so if we're watching the mind to see if a delusion has started to arise, if we confront and avert it without delay, it can dissolve and move on, and wisdom and kindness can reassert itself quite quickly. But if the affliction arises and we don't address it, if we don't notice it at a time, if we don't see it, then it can become a mood or a coloring of the mind and take over. We endanger ourself by creating negative karma. We endanger others. They lose connection with our heart. We respond unskillfully. We might hurt them. And when we finally have self-awareness that knows that there's an affliction driving. Overcoming it is so much more difficult once it has momentum.
And then we go more deeply and think, whenever I see beings who are wicked in nature and overwhelmed by violent negative actions and suffering, I shall hold such rare ones dear as if I had found a precious treasure. It's actually so rare to find someone who has made their mind habituated to negativity so much that the world might call them evil or wicked. Rare to find someone that destructive. And of course, even someone that destructive still has Buddha nature, still can transform their mind. But right now, they're behaving badly, harming others. They're overwhelmed by negative actions and suffering. Why are they a precious treasure when we find them? The chapters in our life that have had an actual enemy, harm doer, a villain who has hurt us or someone we love, or created policies that we think are harmful. Just sit with, why are they precious? What's the benefit in thinking so? And these precious, rare treasures of difficult people aren't just the wicked or the evil. They're also the socially marginalized, people on the outskirts of society who are ostracized. Maybe they have an illness that people are afraid of catching. Maybe they have a mental illness that makes them scary to be around. Maybe they've been branded by society because of their past mistakes. What happens to your mind when you meet someone who is as if surrounded by a cloud of bad reputation? When you meet such a person, one of the first things that often happens is aversion arises in your own mind. We keep saying this enemy or this wicked, horrible person or this repulsive person makes me angry, upset, uncomfortable. But the person doesn't make you feel that way. You make yourself feel that way. You become angry because you don't have patience. If this difficult person was the cause of your uncomfortable feeling, they would make absolutely everyone uncomfortable yet some are indifferent, some are amused, some enjoy them, some even relate to them. They didn't give you anything, but their presence makes you ask deeper questions of your own responses. we could ask ourselves, how did they get this way? I could guess at a million family of origin stories or societal influences, socialization. 
But underneath all of that, I know bad behavior comes from ignorance and comes from suffering. My bad behavior comes from ignorance, comes from suffering. Why would it be different for them? And it comes back to the same idea that when things are easy, it's less likely that we'll change, transform, and develop. When things are hard, it's more likely that we confront our own obstacles, our own weaknesses, and actually actively pursue a spiritual path. These difficult people become like a mindfulness spell waking us up. And they are so precious because of this. And so just summarize those first four verses to yourself by thinking every single sentient being is absolutely useful for my practice of opening the heart, of widening the mind, of developing wisdom and compassion. And it doesn't have to have anything to do with their intentions. They don't have to intend to be of benefit in order for them to benefit me and my practice. And so dedicate these first four to cutting through self-cherishing and self-grasping of developing bodhicitta and the wisdom realizing the emptiness of inherent existence. May method and wisdom lead us all the way to enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And you can relax your attention. Stretch a little bit in your seat and just, uh, if you need a little water, just kind of refresh yourself. So kind of in the beginning, you're working conventional, deeper conventional, deeper conventional, deeper conventional until you get to wisdom. These verses, you don't need to meditate on each of them deeply when you read them. I'm doing each of them deeply now because we're all together. But when you do it in your own practice, just focus on one and do the rest in an abbreviated way, unless you've got tons of time that day. There's um, a really short but really pithy excellent commentary on the eight verses on Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive. It's by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and it's really beautiful. Um, there's also um, a written guided meditation from Tubtin Children on her website as well. So there's some really good free resources on the eight verses just immediately accessible if you want to do any follow-up. Since the, me- the motivation is probably quite clear from the previous meditation, we'll just uh, revive it using Shakyamuni Buddha. So just revive your bodhicitta motivation while doing Shakyamuni Buddha. Ah. Uh-huh.
And so then cutting self-cherishing, cutting self-grasping, going to verse five. When out of envy, others mistreat me with abuse, insults or the like, I shall accept defeat and offer the victory to others. So think of a situation when someone insulted, slandered, disappointed, or verbally abused you. Why on earth do people do that? Is that the action of a happy, contented mind full of peace? The more terrible things said to you or about you, the stronger, more powerful weapons you have to destroy the ego, the delusions. This technique is the opposite of the self-cherishing thought. It's a weapon to destroy it. You avoid negative karma, achieve a positive mind. This is a bodhisattva's practice. This is a special practice to cut life's problems because our main problem is wanting victory over others. The whole problem starts there. We want to win. We have to be bigger than their negative states of mind. We have to be bigger than our negative states of mind. We have to have a mature spiritual practice that says, I don't need to win. I don't need the last word. I keep the cycle of violence going every time I answer back. Someone this insulting is unlikely to hear wisdom from me or from themselves. More practical is to let it run its course for them to settle down and to maybe discuss things later when people are peaceful. Offering victory doesn't mean that you lose dignity. It doesn't mean that you lose self-respect. You're creating a mental atmosphere that gives people a break, a type of forgiveness and acceptance, which gives space for them to change when change is possible. And if you heap this defeat on the ego itself, you only stand to benefit. 
The ego is the one that felt wronged. And then picture a situation where you do offer the victory and imagine the way it can de-escalate the situation. It's a very insecure person who insults others. It's someone with a very fragile sense of self, not in the Buddhist way, but in the worldly way. What if you just let them feel soothed What if you went even further and tried to hear the wisdom within their aggression? They might say all sorts of nonsense, but there might be a grain of truth in there, useful and powerful for your practice. And so then you decide to go even deeper to verse six and look at betrayal. When someone whom I have benefited and in whom I have great hopes gives me terrible harm, I shall regard that person as my holy guru. Not someone I normally have conflict with, but actually someone I care about so much, who have put so much love and care and work into when that person turns around and gives me a terrible harm. That person is the holy guru. Why? So we can unpack it and ask, why did we benefit them? Was it wanting their happiness? Or was it wanting their happiness in a way that was tinged with self-interest? You like the idea of being a helpful and good person. You had expectations of gratitude. you thought they'd turn around and help you someday. All reasonable expectations from the perspective of the world, but not reasonable from a Dharma perspective, because you're trying to rely on something that is fundamentally unreliable, which is a sentient being with afflictions in their mind, expecting a stability that can never be there. and wanting to be repaid. That's not the act of a bodhisattva. And these great hopes that we have in them Are they just expectations, things we think are necessary, not necessarily what they want or what is necessary or possible? And so when they harm us or do what we didn't want them to do, it can show us 
the conditional nature of our love. It can show us where our patience is lacking. It can show us our mistaken assumptions. And so it's okay to acknowledge the pain there. But widen your focus to be able to hold it together with the wisdom it can stimulate. They're the great teacher because they point us out to ourselves. They particularly point out why it is we're trying to be such a good person. Is it from a truly altruistic motivation? Or is it another trap of self-grasping and self-cherishing? If the teacher's job is to show us our mind, what better teacher is there than the one that betrayed us? And so we conclude that in short, both directly and indirectly, do I offer every happiness and benefit to all my mothers. I shall secretly take upon myself all their harmful actions and suffering. So we shift our mind away from pushing away negativity and suffering to voluntarily taking it on. And we shift the mind from attachment that seeks and has hunger for all the pleasures and happiness of samsara and instead gives. So we think everything that I didn't want Now I want it back. Everything that others didn't want, I'll take. And all of this suffering, all of this pain, I give it to the self-cherishing thought, the one to blame for everything. And it in no way harms me. It frees up my heart. And then I send out all of my happiness, all of my causes of happiness, conditions and causes, roots of virtue and merit to all sentient beings. It was from them that I did the actions that planted the seeds for happiness. So this happiness is theirs anyway. I give it back to them. The suffering I experience is because of neglect of them, of obsessive self-focus. So I take it. So put this sending and taking together with your breath and each round of breath, releasing attachment, destroying self-cherishing, And in this way, freeing yourself, healing yourself, grounding yourself in bodhicitta. You can think this suffering and things you don't want take the form of black smoke that you breathe in. The happiness and the things you want to hoard take the form of golden light that you breathe out. Breathe in black smoke, breathe out golden light. You 
every round of breath dissolving that shell covering your good heart, the shell of self-cherishing and self-grasping that feels like protection, but is actually a wall that seems like good boundaries, but is actually a barrier. Each cycle of breath freeing your heart. And then you can simplify, breathe in black smoke, connect with compassion, breathe out golden light, connect with love, breathe in black smoke, taking suffering, breathe out golden light, give happiness. And just allow compassion and love to ride on the breath. And then let go of your focus on the breath and just feel the spaciousness of not resisting, of not chasing or blocking. As if released from the prison of self-obsession. And then dedicate with verse eight. Think undefiled by the stains of the superstitions of the eight worldly concerns. May I, by perceiving all phenomena is illusory, be released from the bondage of attachment. So through the verses that came before, think that you broke the spell, you broke the superstitions all of the lies that attachment tells us, particularly the eight worldly concerns, those pairs of attached hope and fear, grasping, aversion. And as we release the meditation, we keep in mind the idea of seeing all phenomena as illusory. They seem to inherently exist but they're empty of inherent existence. Everything seems to exist from its own side, out there, obvious, telling us what it is. The opposite is true. We're projecting a label on that basis, telling ourselves what it is, and then reacting. May we see the illusion, break the spell. And think all of the energy of these thoughts go toward the development of our fullest potential 
for the benefit of all sentient beings. And we dedicate with the Prajna Paramita Mantra. Tai Hata Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha Tai Hata Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha Tai Hata Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha Okay, thanks guys. Um, so if you're not as familiar with the eight verses and you got triggered at any point, please do read some of the commentaries and um, what is said on the surface often has a much deeper meaning. And um, don't worry, it's not saying that you should be um, thinking of yourself as a doormat or a bad person or anything like that. So just shake that off if it's occurred to you. And um, I think a lot of you have studied them before, so you already know. <laughs> 